You're watching Morning at NTV. Morning at NTV, we are live from Kampala Serena Conference Center. I'm Andrew Chamagero. Now, as Uganda scrambles to respond to the pandemic, it has had to begin to think through things that should be basics, if I should say, like emergencies, ambulance services for pregnant women, coordination between local government investing in health workers and underlying uh, determinants of health, of health like safe water. Now we are seeing a multi-sectoral approach to the pandemic with a political will to address this right from the president's office. We put together a team of experts to help us discuss a health sector that works for Ugandans. We have Ms. Alan Kembabazi, the program's manager of the Right to Health project, an initiative for social and economic rights. We have Dr. Ian Clark, the chairman of the International Medical Group, Dr. Philip Idro, the president of the Uganda Medical Association, and Dr. Olive Kovosinje, whose book, The Patient Tells the Shattered Dreams of the First Planners of Uganda's Health Sector. And joining us live from Kinshasa is Dr. Is Dr. Tamba from Congo a public health expert. Well, starting off, good morning, my great uh, health experts this morning. Good morning. Okay, um, I'll start this for you. What does COVID-19 reveal um, to us about what our healthcare systems could look like um, the government's role? Let, let me start with Dr. Kovacinje. Uh, good morning. So I think what it clearly reveals for for everyone to see is what there's always been, um, a health system in crisis, um, with virtually, virtually everything uh, happening from day to day with not much organization. Um, there's been very poor financing. So what we see today is actually a result of decades of under-investing in the health sector, um, under-investing in our infrastructure, in the personnel, in financing virtually everything in the health sector. So that's what we, we see today with the uh, scrambling, firefighting, emergency recruitment, uh, trying to um, put together an ambulance system with no trained personnel, trying to find money here and there. That really should have been, um, there should have been an organization mm. that would have planned for not necessarily a pandemic, but at least an emergency um, that would pull together those, those resources. So, so what we see today is the result of uh, having uh, prepared very poorly or not prepared at all. Um, it also shows um, a huge gap in, it shows a, a failure of governance. Um, there's been institutionalized corruption, which unfortunately even not up at this very critical time you see, um, you know, health workers still unpaid, still poorly protected. Uh, we've just seen that some of the health workers that are actually confronting uh, COVID-19 patients, uh, not only do they have poor personal protection, they don't have any allowances, they don't have any motivation. Mm. And these are the people that we are expecting to pull us out of this crisis. Uh, we've seen, uh, we, uh, we, we produce virtually nothing. So we don't have te health uh, test kits. We don't have uh, protectives. You know, the perfect example of what has happened is the president uh, appealing to people to, to give him vehicles so that they can work as ambulances. Okay. Well, uh, now going to Dr. Idro, what do you make of this entire health system and uh, the government's role? Dr. Philip? Dr. Philip? Okay. Uh, let, let, let me tap into Alana Kembabazi. Uh, what do you make of all these and uh, the government is role? Do you, what do you make of our health sector as a nation? Thank you. I think it reveals that uh, what we've always known, that this health system does not work for the majority of Ugandans for the poor, for the people in the rural areas, for the persons with disabilities. Uh, we have continuously marginalized and excluded certain groups from the health system as it is. In islands like Sigulu, being pregnant is a death sentence. Like you have to hire the boat, the driver, 
get the fuel to get to a health center two or three if you're lucky because they're islands without health facilities in amda people are walking ridiculously long distances um border men talk about helping women give birth on the road because of the distances there are no facilities no emergency services poor roads that could even get them to the health facility for persons with hearing disabilities who don't have sign language computers they've not been able to really access healthcare or get access to information and these inequalities continue to persist. And in our COVID response, we continue to see these inequalities. What happened? We said, okay, we're going to tell everyone to wash their hands. Information was disseminated initially on social media. Persons with hearing disabilities, it's only a few days ago that they said they'd have sign language interpreters to give such critical information. When the lockdown was initiated, it was then that we began to think, Oh my God, how will persons with disabilities get to hospital? Oh my God, how will pregnant mothers get to hospital? This should be at the heart of our response. Um, the high out-of-pocket costs that continue to, face, to pose a barrier for people to get health care are still an issue when you see someone in Nakawa telling you she's not going to leave her stall to go see, see if she has malaria. She, she has a fever. She could also have COVID. But she won't even seek health care because she doesn't have money. Um, she has to choose between sort of eating and having health care. So it, it, it literally it exposed what we've often known. I think the only difference is that right now, no one can run anywhere. We're all locked here and we have to act, we are forced to actually grapple with what we have let our health system become by underfinancing it, by saying it is inefficient without actually questioning why it's inefficient, by not thinking about, like the doctor said earlier, about basic things like ambulances. Why is it at this point um, are you, you, that you begin to think about ambulances? In 2014, you set up a whole department on ambulances. They should have been a policy that was consistently not funded. Even in the current budget, we see that they are actually going to reduce um, the funding for it. And yet you hear the president going up there and saying, oh my goodness, we need cars. Oh my goodness, can KCCA um, try and get someone here? There's supposed to be a systematic plan, but we have convinced ourselves, you know, in this country, we often say that they are the productive sectors and the consumptive sectors. And we've had the top leadership say that. And health has been marginalized. It's been pushed to the core. When you look at the National Development Plan, it talks about public infrastructure, but the, the social sectors are not considered infrastructure per se. They're considered social sector, social infrastructure. They're left to the private sector to fill the gaps without mm. government stewardship, leadership, and financing. Um, and it reveals that we need a resilient public health system. Absolutely. It's going to be the thank first you. point of call, uh, as we thank, have seen. Thank you, Lana. We need to if, 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 you, if, if we could have Dr. Ian Clark, you've been in the medical, in the medical business for quite a lot of um, uh, many years now. What does this reveal about our health sector now that COVID came? I'm so glad that you are still um, in medicine and in, in, in health care. What does this reveal, Dr. Ian? Um, <clears throat> maybe I wouldn't be um, perhaps as pessimistic as the other speakers. Hmm. Uh, at least in this uh, epidemic, it has shown that people can pull together when they need to. Um, so I think that the health system, yes, I agree that it's been underfunded for many, many years, because that's, but that's a reflection of the politicization of the budget of government. So much goes into the politics and not, not sufficient goes into the issues that people are facing. So that's kind of a general thing. The other thing I'd say about the health system is that it's had uh, a fair bit of... Um, uh, investment in infrastructure uh, uh, and, and not enough in the actual recurrent costs and the running costs. Uh, so you find at the minute we have Malago, new Malago is done, uh, the Wounds Hospital is done, uh, and, and, and we really don't have enough staff to, to really get these places running. In fact, I think in the supplementary budget, definitely they had to put in a budget to get uh, 250 more staff, and that's really for this sort of um, crisis at the present time. Um, and I think, also, you know, in terms of planning, ambulances, there's been all kinds of plans in the past, but then one administration succeeds in other administration, the thing gets dropped, and then they come up and they say, let's buy some more ambulances. And, you know, so there's not a kind of continuity of planning sometimes that, that would really uh, make sure that long-term things are, are attended to. But I, I saw the same thing in KCCA. Um, there, there, wasn't, there isn't in the city a long-term plan that, that says, let's 
let's let's take heavy trucks out of the center of the city and make sure they go to Naman Bay. Let's make sure that our plans are implemented. We've got ideas, we talk about it, but then there isn't an implementation. So I think the health sector is a reflection of many other sectors of government. Uh, and I think actually currently, the people trying to run the health sector are actually really doing their best. Uh, the, the processes of government are, 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 are cumbersome. Um, uh, and I think uh, we, we, should, we should really look at, 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 at how people have actually pulled together in this crisis and, and said, you know, and there's more of a willingness to do something. And then say, can we transfer that into as we move forward? Because we have got a reasonable amount of infrastructure. As I say, we don't have nearly enough money in terms of recurrent budget to, to pay the staff, to train the staff, to make sure they're properly looked after and so on. Uh, and uh, can, we, can we address some of these long-term systemic issues so that we, uh, so that we, you know, we have a good public health system? is the doctor from Diara Congo, Dr. Tamba. It's an honor to have you this morning. Now, Congo is unique at this kind of moment. It's dealing with three um, breakouts. We have measles, we have Ebola again, it's a, resurg it's a resurgent there. And then we have now um, uh, the pandemic of COVID-19. How are you holding up, Dr. Tamba, in, in Jera Congo? Yeah, I think we have almost the same issues with uh, uh, Uganda. Mm. We it's it's clear we have now two outbreaks like we have COVID-19, we have uh, measles outbreak and we have also Ebola. We wanted actually Ebola to end last uh, Monday but unfortunately we still have new uh, cases. So we are struggling uh, with uh, those three issues. As uh, the other people say actually we we the, nine, nine, the COVID actually mm. even for us the, the Ebola is just shown how broken is our uh, healthcare uh, system the public the public health system in the in the in the congo mm. we have some people who can help out uh, but because we lack funding we lack preparedness mm. and sometimes we have emergency plan we have preparedness plans but they are not used even if the emergency plan have the budget and whatever we may need mm. to put in place as resources actually to use in such situations our government actually, they don't put money. So it's when we have the outbreak, when we have the pandemic that you start looking for money. Mm. So we have that uh, issue and the missiles outbreak is just due to the routine immunization that is also broken. We lack money for vaccines and that the consequence. So I think we also, we, we kind of have the same issue with the Uganda public health uh, system mm. we are hopeful that we will overcome this uh, outbreak the COVID-19 but we are still struggling well looking at uh, the pandemic still in your country and these are three already in the same wave what measures has your government put in place to see that it mitigates the nation through this turbulent time because you're having a healthcare you're saying it's a little broken and a little bit underfunded and dealing with three pandemics at the same wave Yes, uh, the, the government actually uh, took some decision actually at the beginning. We had our first case of COVID-19 in the 10th of March. Mm. So I think it took around one week for the government to take the first decisions around uh, uh, that. It was a bit uh, late, but the, the, the government is trying to catch up with, uh, I think we, the countries in Africa, even in the world, has almost take the same taking the same decision, closing the borders, uh, making sure that, for example, Kinshasa, our capital is mm. not locked down, but it's like uh, excluded from the rest of the country. So people cannot travel from Kinshasa to the uh, countryside or from there to Kinshasa. That's kind of the decision that have been uh, made. Okay. We are also in an emergency uh, state uh, mm. right uh, now. Mm. And uh, the other decision is like to try to focus on where is the epicenter of the, the outbreak. For example, in Kinshasa, it's like the municipality that uh, has the, a lot of cases, like the majority of cases has been locked down for two weeks. Uh, now they are thinking even about uh, expanding uh, uh, that. 
So that's the main decision that have been uh, taken so far in the Congo. Thank you so much. That is Dr. Tamba. Please stay with us. Joining us is the president of the Uganda Medical Association. Um, that is uh, Dr. Philip Idro. Good morning, doctor. Now, to bring you to speed, some frontliners who are fighting against uh, the COVID-19 are complaining they're not well remunerated. They have not been paid ever since uh, patient zero to where we are today. What's your stand on that? Uh, good morning, NTV. Mm. Um, that's one of the most unfortunate one. Yes, that's one of the most unfortunate things uh, to have happened. Um, we have engaged Minister of Health, and uh, yesterday the Minister of uh, the Minister of Health uh, uh, communicated that uh, this will be done either today or next week. But uh, right from the on uh, the beginning, indeed, these health workers have not been paid, and these are people who are putting their lives really on on the line, on um, serving Ugandans and working diligently. Um, they are separated there from their families uh, because we do not want them to go back and infect their families. Um, um, it's, it's indeed unfortunate, but we hope this will be sorted out shortly. Well, uh, um, looking at the entire picture of the health structure and uh, what the nation is currently undergoing through, what do you make of the health sector as an, as, as an expert and a president at that level? Um, I, I, I want to to instead focus on the lessons which um, COVID-19 has taught us as uh, Ugandans mm -hmm. and uh, as, as a country and for the health service. I think uh, for, for the first time, um, everybody in this country now knows that uh, we need to fix this health sector. Uh, if we don't fix it, we are not about to go anywhere. Mm -hmm. The planes are shut down. Nobody can go out of this country now. Um, uh, if you fall sick, uh, all of us will go to this same health sector. Uh, I think it is one of the biggest lessons we have we have learned um, that we need to fix this place. Two, um, it has really showed the good nature uh, the, the good nature of Ugandans. People have really come out in big numbers to try to support and see and what what they can do. Um, quickly, three that there are many things which we can do. Like in the past few weeks, uh, our industries, the alcohol industries have instead switched from producing alcohol to producing uh, sanitizers. Uh, two, a uh, nice house of plastics is now making face shields, which, which we are soon going to start using to, as part of the protective uh, equipment. It has stimulated research. Uh, some of our scientists in Makere are now able to, uh, they are starting to produce, they are testing new diagnostic tests. Uh, which we hope it, it can work. The, the engineers are trying prototypes of, uh, uh, of ventilators, uh, but also it has made us to rethink. Now the ministry put ICU capacities in the regional referral hospital, something which will have been done age, uh, ages ago. But for the general pop uh, public, um, uh, people are washing their hands. Um, I think this is in the long term really going to reduce viral diseases. It reduce respiratory diseases after covid i think we may see less and less of this um this this kind of uh, of things thank but, you so much dr um, idro um has, doc, dr idro i'll, I'll yeah. get back to you a little later miss alana kembabazi let me tap your mind about this uh, doctor here says that um, the gesture from the public with regards to donations and the like it is it has in one way or another shown us a picture of how good ugandans are and how the health sector is. What do you make of this entire thing and how do you look at the health sector post COVID-19? See, I, I, I actually disagree. I think we've always known that Ugandans are generous, right? Mm -hmm. uh, we have had to do that as a society. We have to have fundraising drives for someone to get cancer treatment. Oh, yes. uh, you know, we, we take care of each other. Mm -hmm. I think what is different here is we are seeing a uh, strong political will, will to actually address these issues and a multi-sectoral approach to it. For so long, the Ministry of Health has been saying uh, health is not just a Ministry of Health issue. And now we are seeing how, you know, people working on works and transport, if they were really thinking, would be thinking, do we have um, 
roads, not just in, on the mainland, main areas, but in places deep in Amida to get health facilities. Mm. You know, national water, what are you doing around access to safe water? For once, we are seeing everyone put their heads together on that. Mm. But I think in terms of seeing the private sector come in, it's been great to see the corporate social responsibility. Mm. And, I, and I think it, it's something that we should be doing. You do all something, the society from which you benefit so much. But I think what we should be looking at is if it's everything being done in line with government stewardship. Mm -hmm. The government has to be firmly in control of the health sector. Mm -hmm. We don't want a situation of the past where a donor comes and says, this money is just for this. Mm -hmm. This money is just for that, which leads to a very piecemeal approach to implementation. Certain things are favored. The vulnerable groups are often left out. Mm -hmm. We're now seeing the government saying, this is what we need to do. If you want to give, give in line with these priorities. Mm. And that should come through very uh, clearly. I think looking forward at what we would like to see the health sector uh, happen. Mm. One would like to see, like I said before, financing, and so many of, of us have echoed that, but financing that really prioritizes issues that pertain to the most vulnerable, because we have recognized that my ability to stay healthy is dependent on whether or not the lady I buy from vegetables exactly. or the taxi tout is mm. able to get quality health care. And we have to look at that holistically from palliative care to mental health to to cancer care to because these are issues that are that so many Ugandans mm. are unable to have. The second thing, like I said before, is around stewardship and regulation of the private sector. Mm. Um, to have a health sector that works for all, we have to make sure, again, like I say, that everyone is able to get access to quality health care. We have to think through, um, are there gaps in that? We've seen a lot of gaps in the, in the private sector in terms of um, there's just regulation that really captures them fully as much as it would the government sector has been lacking. Um, we've seen high out-of-pocket costs, and that's something that should be really looked at. Mm. Um, the third thing I would hope to see is that we actually systematically, like someone said earlier on, address some of these barriers. A few weeks ago, we were talking about national health insurance. Oh, yes. And we have been talking about it for so many years uh, with very little progress. And the debate then from the employers mostly was it's going to be so expensive to fund uh, for the deductions. And I do hear that debate, but we've seen that ignoring the health sector is going to result in a shutdown of the economy at some point. And so we have to begin to think through very critically how we can um, uh, take advantage of such mechanisms. But when coming up with the National Health Insurance Scheme, again, the starting point must be, does this work for the most vulnerable, for the poor, for the persons uh, with hearing uh, disabilities and, and other disabilities? Mm. Um, I think we need to sustainably think through the issue of financing the health sector in terms of domestic financing. Mm -hmm. We've often left it to donors, and right now you saw America, for example, is pulling out of the WHO. There's going to be a whole lot of fallout around Thank you, Alana. That. And we have to think through where the money is coming from. Exactly. Now, we have money in this country that we just do not track. We mm. have illicit financial flows. And, and, and when the government talks about it, sometimes it says economic crimes, it only touches a little bit of it. Mm. One of the things ISA has been campaigning for has been, can you track the illicit financial flows? Some may be legal, some may be illegal, but know how much we are losing and put that money towards health. We uh, Yesterday I had Honorable Bahati saying that they were going to use money from um, taxes on alcohol and cigarettes, 1% to put towards the HIV trust fund. Mm. We've been saying that we should be getting taxes from some of these goods that we do think have detrimental effects on public health to be financing the health sector so that we know for a fact that there's money allocated to it um, in a sustainable uh, way. And finally, I do hope that we can see um, just very strong uh, multi-sectoral approaches we've been trying to work on um you having a universal health coverage roadmap mm -hmm. i know i sit on an interministerial committee around it but i think there's been a lack of understanding why this again is an interministerial issue mm -hmm. why again it pertains to all sectors and this has revealed it so i do hope that we can do so and in the immediate in the short term right now mm -hmm. as we are prioritizing um this co COVID combating money. COVID. Mm. I hope we can finally reward our health workers with mere platitudes, actually pay them what they deserve, give them the protective equipment, really think through the issues that are most vulnerable. Right now, for example, someone who's trying to get cancer care mm. from Bali is stuck because they can't come to the Uganda Cancer Institute. So we have to, again, there's so many gaps we still have right now. In terms I'm, of gl I'm, I'm, I'm glad Dr. Richard uh, uh, Idroy is here with us. Now, Dr. Olive, at 2015 Human Rights, or rather Human Resource for Health, um, for Health Audit by the Health Ministry, it showed the vacant posts of consultants and senior consultants 
in both national and regional referral hospital, it stood at 61%, while the gap for specialized cadres was at 83%. To date, don't these numbers worry you as someone who cares about the, pa um, uh, the, the, the patients and, of course, the healthcare of the nation and what could be done? Uh, thank you. We, we don't have a great line, but um, uh, I think your question is about the numbers of personnel yes. that are in these uh, various institutions at yes. different levels. Yes. So the, the extent to which, uh, to which the health uh, healthcare workers have, you know, both in terms of training, uh, recruitment, and, and retention in the health sector, uh, we've unfortunately not done well. Uh, and in fact, um, a fairly big percentage of, uh, of positions, of established positions in the health sector are uh, indeed uh, unoccupied. But even those that are occupied, uh, the health workers are being, um, as, as we've said uh, countless times even on this show, uh, poorly paid or not paid at all for some, you know, some months. Um, there's very little incentive for them to work in health facilities. Uh, whose infrastructure is in shambles, uh, where they don't have uh, the equipment and the medicines and anything, everything else that they need to look after their patients. So it is indeed a very um, worrisome situation. Mm. But if you think about the referral hospitals, um, well, so only a minority of patients are actually able to, to access those facilities. Uh, the majority of Ugandans don't even access a health center free, sometimes because they, can't, they don't have transport there or they can't afford the fees that they will be charged there. And even when they do get there, there's no equipment, there are no medicines. So a lot of people are actually left out of this health sector. People don't even know how to access the health sector. How do we get in? How do we get to see a consultant if we need a consultant? How do we get a referral? The referral system in this country has been dead, buried for years, and everybody acknowledges it. So somebody from Kisoro has to find their way on a bus, purely on their own means, sick, and, and they somehow have to find their way to a referral hospital. Mm. And these kinds of things have gone on for a long time. That's why when we arrive at today and we don't have a health system to pull us out of this crisis, mm. we begin to realize, we, first of all, you know, as, as the, the previous speaker just said, we need a health system that works for everyone. We need to put equity right up front to be sure that it's not just the few that are connected and powerful that can take public funds and go to a foreign hospital, mm. but we fix this system so that it works for us, so that it works for every Ugandan. Because if it doesn't work for the majority of Ugandans, it mm. doesn't work at all. Well, and I you. think we need to be looking at that when we think of training, mm. what kind of personnel we need. We need a grand plan. We need a major reform of mm. our health sector. To begin to ask those questions that are fundamental, what do we want this sector to do? Who do we want it to serve? And how can we best get there? And okay. we're not going to get there mm. by tinkering with the ages right now. Mm. We're not going to get there by saying, let's fix this little thing, thing here. And when COVID-19 ends, mm. the first plane loads carry away the powerful and the wealthy to go to foreign hospitals. We are going to have to reform it right from the core to make sure that it actually serves the interest of the interests of Uganda. Ladies, uh, and we are going to have to look at the governance to ensure that we can actually do that. Ladies and gentlemen, just for just for just I'm just going to take a break and I'm going to have this conversation reignited. Please stay where you are. We still have a conversation. Thank you so much, Alana, Dr. Tamba, Dr. Ian Clark, and of course Dr. Richard Idro. Please stay where you are. We're taking a break and we'll be back shortly. This is Morning Eden TV. Watching Morning at NTV. Hello again, welcome back to Morning at NTV. I'm Andrew Chamagero, and we are live from Kampala Serena Conference Center. With me today, we are discussing about the health sector vis a vis the COVID 19 pandemic. With me, I have a Dr. Tamba from uh, Diera Congo. I have a Dr. Olivia Kobsin. I have a Dr. Ian Clark. And I have a Miss Alana Kembabazi. Starting off from the Diera Congo, Dr. Tamba. What do you learn from other countries, you as DRC, with the current pandemic? Uh, I think what uh, I am personally learning from other countries is uh, the way they can make their public health system uh, flexible, uh, 
-hmm. I think this uh, COVID-19 has uh, challenged uh, us in the traditional way of thinking about uh, issues, in our traditional ways of thinking about how to, to, to solve issues, as I mentioned. I think we are learning also that uh, our health system uh, should be innovative especially we have seen that for example from a uh, mask for face for example mm. the the entire world actually was out of stock of masks so people needed to be innovative actually to design uh, masks to find solutions okay. and uh, to fix that uh, issue to get protected i have also learned from our, from our country personally that the basic infrastructure for the public health system is very very important for example in the dr congo when we we have had our we we we, we the first patient actually tested first tested tested positive the entire uh, city of kinshasa had only 50 ventilators wow so imagine that what is happening in italy happened in here in kinshasa it would be like catastrophic so mm -hmm. i've also learned that we need to be like to build like basic infrastructure especially for the public health uh, system and also to make our communication as public health experts very clear. Because at the beginning, the government, like especially the Ministry of Health in my country, was a bit, a little bit hesitant and not clear about the way they were like communicating about this uh, issue, which actually uh, brought a kind of uh, lack of confidence in the health system because the authorities were not uh, that clear about the issue and where to get. They were providing actually a phone number that was not going through you know people are calling and it's not going through to get some advices and so on people have concerns so that communication issue i think we have also learned about that that we need to fix we i have also noticed that for example for the covid 19 um massive technique uh, massive uh, like uh, massive uh, Testing actually has kind of worked in our country to make like tests available for like people with symptoms and so on to test a lot of person like when it's uh, needed and make the treatment available on time. I think it's one of the lessons I've also learned from like other country and what we can uh, also implement in my country. founders, we call them the village health teams or the VHTs. Um, what exactly are they doing and what is their role? Uh, what, what role do you envision them in the health sector post the COVID-19? Dr. Ian Clark, we are looking oh, at the sorry. VHTs. Yes. The, the VHTs. Well, the VHTs are um, the village health team they are the health workers which are really at the base of the pyramid mm -hmm. and they're the people in the community who can actually know what's going on and then advise uh, uh you know whether a person should go to a maternity center uh uh you know uh, issues such as family planning things like hand washing and so on and so forth mm -hmm. but uh vhts i think uh, were supposed to be implemented in the whole health system planning, but that was, uh, as far as I know, the funding for it was scrapped. Mm. Um, so the, the idea that you have VHTs uh, and have a whole system that's built like a pyramid is mm. a good idea. Um, but as I say, what we need is long-term planning so that we implement these ideas and just don't sort of lurch from one administration to another. <clears throat> Um, uh, and uh, hello. Oh yeah, I can hear you, Doc. What we are looking okay. at. Uh, what do? What role do you envision them in the health sector post COVID nineteen? The VH teams. Well, the VH teams. You see, I don't know how many of them are in place, but the VH teams are a very good resource to sort of help people. They get trained to do training of trainer sessions, and then they get trained and they're in the community. They're able to not only pick up things that people can do to prevent COVID-19 mm -hmm. from spreading, uh, or if there's any risk cases in the community, people who look suspicious who need testing, but also for those other things like the mothers who are who are uh, uh, need to go to their antenatal classes, you know, mm -hmm. all, all, all of those kind of things. What you need is the sort of system 
whereby you pick up the risks and you make sure you're doing the preventive things. You, you make sure that vaccinations are being done, that people who uh, are taking their treatment for TB, HIV, mm. all of those kind of things. And then you have on top of it. So that's the kind of health surveillance and preventive system. And then on top of that, you have the referral system. So the person can then be referred to go and, and have their baby safely or, or, or their mission hospital or to have their lab tests and so on. One of, the th one of the observations I would make about the health sector is that even if we look at the response to COVID-19, mm. yes, it, it, it maybe hasn't been perfect, but I think that Uganda has done very well. If you look uh, at the numbers of cases in the neighboring countries and so on, Uganda's generally doing much better. Mm -hmm. At the present time, they really got to drive on to test the truck drivers uh, because there's a few thousand of those are coming across the border every day. Um, and I think in terms of our surveillance and our public health measures, in terms of our um, response to Ebola, in terms of uh, uh, so some of the public health measures, in terms of HIV, uh, mm. the, the Uganda has done not badly. Uh, the, the, the criticisms often in the health sector are in the the actual centers the, 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 of referral for curative services. Uh, and this is why big people fly out of the country. Um, and that's where we tend to fall down. And as I say, so, so, there's a lot of money put into capital projects, but mm. then the vote in parliament to run these projects properly, because you can't run them without people, without good um, HR, uh, it isn't often there. So you find, you know, like a, I was in the Kampala, um, the new woman's hospital, lovely mm. hospital, but I, but, I, but I don't see the full quota of staff yet. I don't see, you know, the, 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 the training and the resources that are put into that. Okay. So, you know, we need long-term plans and then we need to invest the recurrent costs of, of, um, of, the, of, the, of the health Thank you, Dr. Ian Clark. Um, Dr. Ian Clark, let, let, let me talk to now to Dr. Uh, Dr. Idro. We have seen uh, medical professionals running away from um, patients, of course, in COVID-19. We want to know, are our professionals mentally prepared to handle this from the grassroots level to the national level? Um, um, uh, I don't think I have seen any of the health workers running away from Well, the, we have. We have run stories here. Hello? Yes, you we can have. Get me? Yes. Uh, we, I don't think we have had reports of health workers running away from patients. Uh, uh, however, um, the implementation of uh, this uh, COVID-19 uh, responses in terms of health, uh, health workforce has, has been rather sluggish. The initial setup was uh, <coughs> for um, in Entebbe and Molago, and the training lagged by, uh, behind. But right now, we are catching up. However, what uh, health workers, what we see, which has been unfortunate, and it is uh, characteristic of the health service in, mm. the, in the country, as uh, Dr. Clark mentioned, is the kind of investment in our health services. For example, you just mentioned right from the beginning up to today, even the health workers who are working are not being paid the allowances. We have interns in uh, Kabale and Piana, people who are supposed to be at the front line, they are striking uh, because they have not been paid their allowances. Um, they uh, so the, uh, the allowances are irregular, something really which has been uh, generational. You wonder why mm. such things which will just be regular, which will be fixed by public service commission, that on the 30th or 31st of a month, you get your salary. And, and they are, this is what they live on. It's a very small money what they eat on and what, um, what they live, uh, live on. The other thing is um, uh, one of the lessons which has come out very clearly is the infrastructure. For example, as soon as the shutdown occurred, mm. um, it, it was unclear how people were supposed to get to work. Um, then the nurses who live in SETA, uh, public transport was shut down. There were no buses to take them. And, uh, and who was to deliver the women who came to hospital? It mm. took a week plus before to start getting people in. <coughs> but uh, you saw even in Nakuru, the uh, minibus tr uh, putting more than 20, uh, 25 nurses in in a, min, a small minibus to try to deliver them, really desperate um, uh, measures. In the past, um, the health infrastructure, um, uh, for example, around Mulago, near the runabout, those buildings which has, have been fenced up nicely, and I think it, they were taken up by CMI, and I don't know who now owns it, um, that, that, those were living quarters for health workers who mm. were working in the Mulago hospital. Such places have been taken over, and um, 
and there are no places. Now you have uh, Kirudu Hospital or Kawempe Hospital being built, but mm. with no accommodation for the health workers to stay near in and come and serve people. So these are some of the lessons that in future, that as we build the health infrastructure, that we have accommodation which is near, that people who, who work in this service are catered for, they stay near enough, even in such catastrophes, they are able to, to just walk and uh, to... to Thank to you. Thank you. Th thank uh, you so much, one, Doctor. One, uh, one more thing. Mm. Uh, one more thing about the VHTs. Mm. Um, for example, one of our biggest worries right now is mm. um, uh, community services in terms of uh, immunization and antenatal care. Right. Um, it is going to be five weeks of... Um, no, um, um, uh, re literally, um, uh, immunization services not going on in the community. And this can easily roll back um, uh, the, our achievements in immunization, polio, measles, and even the pregnant women. And the VHTs in the community really know this. And we are suggesting that um, maybe with the food distribution or something like that, something really needs to be done uh, quickly so that babies in the community are immunized and also the pregnant women are attended to. It is Thank really you. urgent things which, which we think. And the VHTs and the local councils um, may, uh, may be able to help us in this. Now, about the immunization and the vaccines, uh, we had the Minister of Health, uh, that was a week ago, and uh, she allocately said that vaccinations are still ongoing at the different health centers and people can actually access them and have them vaccinated. But uh, she gave the standing orders how this should be done. Dr. Kobu Sinji, uh, try to paint for us a picture about the patient in Uganda. You've written a book about this, how patients don't know their rights, they don't know the dynamics and the modalities in which they have to plug into to get quality service and to account and to put people in the powers that be account for whatever time and monies and experience and professionalism. Throw a light about that, Doctor. Uh, thank you. So actually, I think that Dr. Kembabazi, who spoke earlier, gave a perfect description of the Ugandan patient. Mm. Um, the patient that is left on their own, that has to find their way to a health facility, that has to uh, use their, you know, dip in their pockets to find mm. transport, to buy health care, and maybe to not even get it and to end up with a border border cyclist as their mm. um as their midwife i think i think we need to look at this so not just the patient the person that needs health care but also to look at the entire system as the patient and mm. to see how neglected that patient has been um because a lot of people uh, think about the patient as the person that walks into a hospital but think about the person that works in the hospital and that sometimes these people also need health care and really can't afford the health care that they are delivering to other people they, they also need laboratory tests they need x-rays the x-rays are at a cost and you find that the health workers who work in this system and their achieve their families can't afford health care and then in this same setting public servants, very highly placed public servants, take public funds and go and get to grab health care elsewhere. And I really hope that even as Ugandans have been really patient and I mean the entire country is a patient, I, I hope that we really learn this lesson that however we come through the next week, few weeks or months, you know, I know there's going to be a lot of tumble and fall and rise, Whenever we come to this, I, I really hope that we don't lose this teachable moment. This is a really important moment in our history mm. that we need to look carefully at our health sector, the health sector that we created, that we have allowed to almost die, mm. and that we then begin to rebuild it ourselves. I know that in the past, you know, Dr. Clark just said that, oh, we've, you know, we've done relatively well. I'll tell you what, in previous epidemics, but I think the ministry will call, you know, WHO and CDC and, and uh, you know, Red Cross, and they would all come to our aid. Now the entire globe is on fire, mm. and we have to fix it ourselves. And, 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 and that's not necessarily a bad thing. We have plenty of capacity in this country ourselves. We can fix this ourselves. We don't need consultants. We don't need somebody to come from WHO somewhere or World Bank somewhere. We need to fix this ourselves. We have the capacity and we have the resources. You know, a lot of people think, oh, yeah, there's no money. There's no money for this. If you think about it, Dr. Clark referred to this fabulous hospital, the, the Monago Women and Children's Hospital. That hospital was budgeted at 33 million US dollars. 
if I tell you that every year we spend three to five times that amount of money sending people to go and get healthcare abroad. If we would save that money, it is more than enough to give us a decent healthcare system that is run by Ugandans for Ugandans. Well, as we're winding up, uh, each one of you has one one minute to wrap it up. Let me start with Dr. Tamba from DR Congo. It has been a very much more uh, regional conversation. Dr. Tamba, one minute as we're signing out. What could be your last word? Uh, I think my last word would be to uh, keep up about what is happening and our, what our political dealers are doing uh, in our country. The second thing will be actually to use all the resources of our countries. I think Dr. Kobi Singe said that as well, we have resources here. We have to think about how to use our own resources, uh, like people, money, infrastructure. We still have something here we can use and uh, we think about how to use them in such a, a, a situation. I think we should also work a bit hard on how to prepare our public health system mm. to be more resilient uh, when it comes to uh, outbreak and pandemics like COVID-19. Thank COVID you so much, Dr. Thank Tamba. Thank you so much. Uh, Dr. Ian Clark, one last word. Uh, well, I, I want to thank all the corporate uh, uh, sector who really weighed in to, to do what they can to help uh, telecoms, all, all kind of people. One, one initiative I'm working on at the minute is mm. to get free soap into the slums of Kampala, soap that really lathers up well, which mm. can be made locally and with instructions on, on hand washing. Uh, and that's that's been heavily supported by the corporate sector. Mm. Uh, and I, I also do think that the, at the level of uh, the Minister of Health and so on, they have really tried. Uh, and, 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 and what we're seeing at the minute is that what can happen when we all move together, even though it's very imperfect, but the problem with the health sector is it's not seen as a priority sector by the real you know, top leadership in the country. So let's make it a priority sector. And as uh, all have said, we can, you know, tremendous professionals within the country, if they're facilitated, and we can move together. Thank you so much. Uh, Alana Kimbabazi, as we're winding up, what could be your last word, Alana? Um, I would conclude by saying we really need to make sure we are putting um, the most vulnerable at the heart of our response in the health sector. Uh, the very essence of Ubuntu I am because you are is the idea that my interdependence is tied up with yours. And I think we need to do that by actually looking at the financing and making sure it is trickling down to those women in Amda to Sigulu that have really been struggling for a long time with personal disabilities that are being completely ignored. Mm. I think it has shown that we can't find the money. We have found it after all, that they can be multi-sectoral coordination and this needs to continue. And there has to be participation of the people in this. Mm. A lot of what has been happening in this response, people actually know what they need. If you ask them and say, how do we combat COVID? Some of the things like, for example, what Dr. Ian Parker said, like having wa water and soap, making sure they're accessible in the slum areas, deep in places like Amazon that have no safe water, um, are really critical. So I think making sure there's participation and really emphasizing that we must have finance the health system with a, a public health system that is resilient because it's the first point of call for the most vulnerable among us. If you want to tap into your remarkable experiences and great thoughts about the health sector of this nation, please stay home and stay safe and practice social distancing. Well, that is a conversation we have had this Saturday morning, and thank you so much for those of you who have been online. A couple of you have been discussing, of course, offline, but uh, it is something remarkable. Now, just to tap into, many of you are celebrating your birthdays today. We have uh, Olive uh, Smiles today. Uh, you're saying that uh, happy birthday, Brian Nemer. Then uh, Winnie Tricia says that happy birthday, and I want to say happy birthday to you, Sharon Christine. Then Nasozi Florence says... My friend Anne Banye Suize, happy birthday. Lastly is Eston Giroux saying happy birthday, my friend Shaggy Case. My name is Andrew Chamagran. Shortly after me, Mwasu Zemte is coming up with uh, Farid Nakazwe. But remember to follow us on Twitter and Instagram and on Facebook. It's NTV Uganda. Good morning.